Hello and good afternoon. For those of you I have not met yet, my name is Kaylin Riswold and I am the President and CEO of the Naperville Area Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of our staff, our Board of Directors, I would like to officially welcome you to the State of the City. It is good to be here today, right? Today marks our 32nd annual State of the City Address, and we are thrilled to bring this to you once again fully in person. <laughs> we know this event is a staple of the business community, and we appreciate your desire to be present and stay informed about this great city of ours. The Naperville Area Chamber of Commerce and the City of Naperville have been longstanding partners in this event, and also pro-business advocates for our city. It is the Chamber's job to move business forward, and that business forward philosophy is always front of mind for Naperville. I would like to thank Mayor Chirico for being a strong and decisive leader throughout your two terms, and I'm eager to hear what you have to say today. This is his seventh address, not his final one, but his seventh one, and we are thrilled to have him here today. I would also like to thank our city council and our elected officials who are present with us here today. If you are an elected official, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for joining us here today. We also have so many people who work for the city of Naperville. If you work for the city of Naperville, please also stand to be recognized. I see you all back there. <laughs> Thank you. And the Naperville Area Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, you're not getting out of this either. Please stand to be recognized. Thank you so much for your guidance and support. Today's event would not be possible without your support and without the support of our sponsors. Our presenting sponsors are Navistar, who's here, thank you so much, Stephen Anthon Labs, and Spinezy Americas, thank you so much for being our presenting sponsors here today. We also have our silver sponsors of BMO Harris Bank and Comcast Business, thank you for your contribution. Programs of this magnitude and what a magnitude we have here today are just not possible without our sponsors and without all of you here. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Judge Kavita Athanakar, who will help us welcome Mayor Chirico today. Before being named a DuPage County Associate Judge in 2018, Judge Athanakar practiced law in both private and public sectors. This included her work as in-house counsel for the city of Naperville, and she's presided over DuPage County's drug court for the past three years and was most recently appointed to the county's circuit court in 2021. When not serving on the bench, Judge Athanakar and her husband both loved to give back to Naperville, a city they are proud to call home. Please help me welcome Judge Athanakar to the stage. Great leaders give people something to believe in. And in the last seven years, Mayor Steve Cherico has given the business community and the people of the city of Naperville a tremendous amount to believe in. In 2015, when Steve Cherico became the mayor of Naperville, I had the pleasure of working alongside him as one of his attorneys. I had a firsthand view of his leadership style which was really just a true reflection of his own character, that including being honest, driven, courageous, and resilient. In the following three years of our work as his attorney, it was evident that Mayor Cherico was going to enhance the landscape of Naperville in ways that could not be imagined. The internal and external infrastructure he built connected all sectors of the city. His outlook on future growth and efficiency fostered good government. In 2018, when I was selected to serve on the bench, my firsthand perspective turned into a bird's eye view 
And in looking at the last two years, I think we can all appreciate how Mayor Cherico has led this city during the most difficult of times. His resilience has become the resilience of business owners, police officers and first responders, of families and educators, and of healthcare workers who have persevered and pushed through to the other side. His strength became the power of chamber members, elected officials, and other leaders who looked to Mayor Cherico as a true example of leadership. A great leader creates more leaders, and as I look around this room, that is evidently true today. So I know, so now I'd like to introduce you to Naperville's great leader, the one who has elevated and stretched the canvas of this city as we know it. Please put your hands together for Mayor Steve Cherico. Thank you, Judge. A fun fact is I originally asked Judge Athanakar to introduce me to this event in 2020. That was just a few days before the pandemic took hold. So, Judge, thanks for following through on my invite two years later, but you did follow through, and I appreciate it. Wow. Can we just start off by appreciating that we're all here together in person again? Have a round of applause for that, right? I want to say thank you to the Embassy Suites for hosting our first in person State of the City since 2019. It's all possible thanks to Kaylin Riswold and the Chamber's hard work. Kaylin has been a phenomenal leader through a very tough two years. Thank you, Kaylin. And congratulations to the new Chamber Board Chair-elect, Adrian Aldridge. Good start for the clapping there, Adrian. <laughs> He'll lead the board starting next year after Christina Caton Kitchell finishes her term in December. Our businesses are both in good hands with them. Thank you. And a special thank you to my production team for this year's speech and videos. Last year, I mentioned the word pivot was the word of 2020. And this team has lived out that word for several years. Thanks to Liz Spencer and her crew at NCTV 17, the Naperville Communications team, and Jaffe Films and Events. Thank you. <clears throat> Members of my family are here today as well, including my wife, Julie, and our two children, Dana and Lauren. Thank you for being here. They all bring color and light to my world, and I am very appreciative. Now, I should say my growing family, because in 2021, we welcomed two new grandbabies to the mix. Our grandson, Griffin, actually lives in my Naperville home, my old Naperville home, my old bedroom, to be exact. I'd like to think we're just helping Naperville grow. Indeed, Naperville is growing. Our population after last year's census is over 149,000. We've grown 5% in the last decade. It's pretty impressive in a state where our population is declining. And as a result, Naperville will receive a larger portion of the state shared revenues over the next 10 years. Finally, I'd like to thank all of, thank all of you in this room. You keep reinvesting in the landscape of this community, even when it's challenging. And what hasn't been challenging since 2020? What hasn't changed? Our job as local government is to help you adapt to that change, to 
to look beyond what's happening right in front of us and create a clear picture of what Naperville should look like in the future. This year, I want to remind us the picture that we created both before and during the pandemic. I also want to preview the new portrait that we'll create. You've probably guessed from my intro video and the words portrait, landscape, and picture that I'm weaving the concept of art into this year's speech. And it's really fitting to describe where Naperville is now and what we've done to get to this point. Think about it. A painting captures the past while also sending a message to those who view it now. It shows what was important at that moment, what had meaning to the artist at that time. Our city council has primed Naperville's canvas by building our financial resources and setting priorities to succeed in a post-pandemic world. Perhaps that's why we were the only Illinois city in money's best places to live list in 2021. We, we also, it's also why we received the Better Business Award, Better Business Bureau Award. And it's why we were named the safest city in America by Money Geek and the best place to raise a family once again by Niche. That's impressive. <laughs> All of these efforts take time. We move forward in phases. It's not always obvious or splashy, but we aren't without a purpose or a plan. Planning is critical, because sometimes, sometimes there's a different picture in store for us. Like on June 20th, when the EF3 tornado touched down in southeast Naperville. Let's take a look back at that night from the view those, of those who responded to it. I was actually working that night, and so we were getting a lot of alarm calls to our dispatch center. We had to prioritize finding out, number one, where they were, if they were injured, the extent of the injury, if they needed support immediately, trying to calm them, keep them safe where they were if possible, and advising them that they needed to wait until help arrived. That was hard because traditionally, we can, in a normal 911 situation, most of the time we can stay on the phone. During this type of significant incident, we had to prioritize, get all that information, and explain we had to disconnect, which was very difficult when you know that normally you try to calm them the entire time. And then once we knew that the tornado had touched down, it was all hands on deck. We deployed all of our available resources to that area and started our search and rescue mission. We have to get figured out how large of a swath of area the town is. You know, we're focused here on Cinnamon Creek, but there was a lot of other 911 calls coming in throughout the city and how big of a scope was it and how far to the east did it go. We knew we had one person trapped in their home. We figured there'd be multiple. Basically, we sent teams to every single residence in the impacted area um, to make sure you know, that everybody was safe. We had to close down all the streets. We, we called for additional resources from other agencies to come and assist us with that. We had worked with the Red Cross to set up a shelter area so that you know, the, the residents in that area had a place to go, and we worked on getting them to that location. Um, and we just continued our efforts you know, one step at a time. When I heard the reports coming through that it was a long-lived tornado and still on the ground, I, I, I told my wife, I, I'm going to be going to work and going to be there for a while. Our crew, our initial role was um, we were going to set up at the last pole that was still up in the air and try to isolate the wires that were laying on the ground and, and try to get that pole safe and secure so we could get the power restored to as many people as we could. I mean, we deal with storm damage, you know, all the time, but dealing with something of, of this magnitude, the approach is still the same. You know, whether you got, you know, five calls or 500 calls, like something like with a tornado, I mean, we can only do one job at a time. So we're focusing on, you know, this tree that's blocking the street right now. And then, and then we're gonna go, go to the next one. I never walked the entire scene it was starting to unwind, so to speak. We were winding down, we were starting to release companies. Um, 
and myself and Chief Sergeant walked the entire area and just the magnitude. Because in the middle of the night when it's dark and you don't, you don't have eyes on the entire situation, you, you can only go off of what you're getting reports back from the folks in the field. I remember being on scene and seeing, you know, a half of a house just wide open and seeing children's clothes and toys and, you know, that was heartbreaking for me to see that. I have kids and knowing, you know, kind of the aftermath that they were going to go through. Um, but thankfully, we did not have any fa uh, fatalities or, you know, real significant injuries, so I, I'm thankful for that. We really couldn't have done it without uh, the volunteers' help, you know, Roar and everybody else that I uh, gave a hand, so it was uh, much appreciated. I'm thankful that we had the resources available to, to be out there, you know, 24 hours a day during the aftermath of that. And I think that we were able to give our residents a, a little sense of comfort and peace knowing that we were out there and we were very diligent about protecting that area. This was in the evening, 7 or 8 p.m. on the day, well, the day after the storm. We were working 16 hours that day and there's a lady who came out with a sack full of cheeseburgers she made on her grill to, to give to all of us working. And I, I thought, here's a lady whose lights have been out, but she looked out in the street and seen people working and wanted to do what she could. And, and that really struck me as, as it, I, I won't forget it. I mean, It's what we do. It's our job and we're, we're here to protect the citizens. We've, we took a sworn oath when we get hired to protect the citizens of the city. It's gracious for them to thank us for what we are trained to do. It makes me feel good just knowing I'm providing a service to those folks all day, every day, not just in time of need. In law enforcement, our entire career is spent around working with people during the worst times of their life. I mean, nobody calls us to tell us they're having a good day. So, you know, for us, it's kind of normal to, to be around people when they're at their worst moment. I just hope that we as an agency lived up to the expectation of our community and helped them you know, as much as we possibly could during that, that time when they were in need. I love that line, nobody calls us to tell us they're having a good day. <laughs> hey, I'm proud of our response and how prepared we were. We restored services quickly and we improved them at the same time. Our partners at the state, including State Senator John Curran, have advocated for the tornado victims since the storm. Thank you, Senator Curran, for all your leadership. And our staff is still in touch to this day to help with long-term recovery. Let's have a round of applause for all the city directors who led this incredible effort in 2021. Thank you. You know, Preparedness isn't just about being ready for the worst case scenario. It's about clearly defining our priorities so we're all working on common goals, even on our best days. There's a motto that our new police chief, Jason Aries, lives by. A life without goals is an endless journey to nowhere. And that's true for life and business. And it's that mindset that helped Jason become Naperville's 11th police chief last year. Well, I wish we could have applauded him, Chief Aries in person, but he is actually in Seattle at a conference this week. Uh, he's sharing the police department's best practices, and there's a lot to share. Naperville's 2021 crime statistics show a reduction in major crime in almost every area. Let's give him another round of applause anyway. You see, you need to know where you're going so that you can plan your path there. That's why we worked with the community to create the bridged 2023 priorities plan last year. It puts on paper the work we've already started in five areas. Infrastructure and utilities, sustainability, public safety, financial stability in the economy, and affordable housing. Each of these areas gives us the color that we need to create Naperville's new portrait. Now, infrastructure may not seem very colorful or exciting. You don't always see the work that's taking place, and it can seem more of an inconvenience than really anything else. But it does make a difference. It's how we get reliable electricity and clean water with the flip of a switch or a faucet. 
It's how we safely get from one place to another on our roads. These are big projects, and they pay off over decades. And you can't push this work off. Replacing your infrastructure is a whole lot easier and cheaper when you plan for it, instead of waiting for it to break. Even during a pandemic, we have to remember, though, to invest in ourselves. And part of that is taking pride in how our community looks. One of the most noticeable investments is in the downtown. The first phase of our Streetscapes project finally began earlier this month. We'll refresh, refresh the look along Jefferson, Maine, Jackson, and Webster this summer, and we'll replace all the outdated utilities under these roads at the same time. This minimizes the future disruptions to the visitors and businesses. We know this work is never going to be convenient, but we can look to the past to help us know we're making the right decision today. Forty years ago, our downtown revival plan took, took off when we built the Riverwalk. After the Fox, Fox Valley Mall opened, the Can Do Group worked hard to make the downtown a place to come. The public and private sectors worked together because they knew that reinvesting in Naperville's core would keep people coming back to our city. Their actions were a leap of faith, and it paid off. Across our city, our crews, our utility crews, are hard at work both above and below ground. Our electric team is implementing a new outage management system. They're making sure we can support more electric vehicles and solar installations. And over 45% of our water meters are now read wirelessly. And we're investing heavily in our water mains to keep them from breaking in the, in the future. All of this is possible through the new utility rates that, uh, and the funds that are provided through those rates. Look, none of us likes to pay more for anything, especially in today's world. But even with all these investments, our average residential electrical rates are still below ComEd's. Let's move on to sustainability, our second priority. This is a major topic of interest to our community, but it's certainly not a new one. Sustainability is personally something that I've invested in for years by adding solar panels to my business and driving electric vehicles. On a city level, we saw some huge successes in 2021. We cut the ribbon on a 3,000-panel solar system last June. These panels generated enough electricity to supply 180 customers for a year. Our CNG station received a public-private partnership award from the Chicago Area Clean Cities Coalition. And our electric utility was named a smart energy provider because of its leadership in energy. We hired our first sustainability co coordinator, Ben Mielsness. And in August, the City Council held a workshop with the Naperville Environmental and Sustainability Task Force, better known as NEST. Their sustainable Naperville 2036 plan outlined ways for us to be more environmentally friendly. City staff and NEST came together to create a way to move forward in 22 and beyond. We'll continue to invest in, in, invest in ways to reduce our energy use, and we'll continue to invest in developing more renewable energy resources in our community. You see, sustainability is a conversation that doesn't have boundaries. We all live in the same, we have the same, share the same air, and water, and climate, and we can't tackle this topic alone. This year, we'll deepen our partnerships in Naperville and across the region, including collaborating with organizations and businesses like yours. These first two priorities are only possible because of our third, public safety. We can't focus on leading the way without having a safe community. Former police chief Bob Marshall was a large part of our success in this area. We said goodbye to him in 2021 after 44 years at both the police department and city hall. Chief Marshall did everything from patrolling the, street, the streets to investigating crimes before becoming the, the assistant city manager in 2005. When he returned to the department in 2012, he revamped officer training to focus on de-escalating situations and making us a leader among police departments nationally. He put his officers first by creating a peer support team and improving the culture on our force. With Bob, it was about accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And that led to a safer neighbor. By the way, those three traits I just mentioned, they start with an A, R, and T. 
art. Fitting for today's speech, right? And it was fitting that he ended his career by bringing closure to the 49-year-old Julie Hansen case last June. Bob is here with us today, and I'd like to give him a very special round of applause for all the years of public service. I'm confident that Chief Aries will carry on the police department's legacy while painting a, port a new portrait of his own. The department is already finding new ways to innovate and connect with the community. The police department launched our Text to 911 program in September. This is a new way for those who are deaf or have hearing loss or speech difficulties to connect to 911, or when speaking out loud, would put the caller in danger. It's a great example of how we're always expanding our capabilities to serve the community. Another way the city is having all of our, another way is, is that we're having our, all of our officers wear body cameras by 2022. This will help build even more community trust and transparency. It will also improve investigations and increase officer safety. Our fire crews were busy responding to 16,000 calls last year. 16,000 calls. That's the highest number of calls in the department's history. They continue to lead the way in saving lives, too. The national cardiac survival rate is only 13%, but Naperville, it's at almost 30%. And they're not stopping there. The department's strategic plan calls for continuing to develop community risk reduction programs. These provide resources to help the most vulnerable in the community, like seniors and those with functional or mental health needs. The ultimate goal is to provide the right care to the right person. This helps residents lead healthier lives and reduces the need for traditional emergency services. Thank you, Chief Pucknitis, and your leadership. <laughs> Financial stability and the local economy are the primary colors that, our, that make up our community canvas. We cannot provide our services or build our infrastructure, much less improve them, without consistent funding. There's a good reason for this, is our, that this, this is our next priority that I'll discuss. We get our revenue from many different sources, like taxes, fees, and utility charges. And we keep these revenues very competitive. Naperville residents will pay the second lowest regionally for their city services. Nearly all of our revenue streams have recovered to pre-pandemic levels, and a few, like sales and income tax, grew beyond what was normal before the pandemic. Now think about that. During a pandemic, our businesses adapted so well that we actually brought in more dollars to the community. We ended up the year with our sales and income taxes 23 and 43 percent, respectively, above our projections. And all of you contributed to this tax base. Let's pause to see who has joined us and who will shortly.
While many doors opened last year, we also said goodbye to a few long-term favorites. It's challenging to see these businesses and their run. And while we can't keep everything the same, we can keep our city growing. Flexibility and working through issues that uh, may stop developments is what makes this happen. It's, a ma it's, a ma it's how major developments like the district, neighbor commons, and the new mosque on 248th were approved last year. And it's how we've filled empty buildings that, that will have a positive economic impact for the next decade or longer. Christine Jeffries from the Naperville Development Partnership plays a big role in filling these spaces. Christine, thanks for all you do to keep our local economy moving forward. You can tell Christine's shy. <laughs> Last year, we accepted almost 6,000 building permit applications. That's the most since the building boom of the 1990s. 2021 also showed us how more affordable development can meet the needs of residents and developers, which is a nod to our fifth priority, affordable housing. The Vantage Naperville apartments on Ogden Avenue were fully leased only after only three months of, after opening. And last year, we put the call in for developers to bid on the city land in South Naperville. The goal is to build affordable housing for seniors and those with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. All of this requires us to match the needs of the moment with the appropriate financial resources. We can't continue to grow, to, we can't continue residential and business growth without making it affordable to live here and do business here. But we also need to invest in ourselves. And I believe we do a good job of balancing the two. The city's 2022 budget is more than last year's by almost 8%. But there's good reason for that, capital spending. I talked a lot about infrastructure earlier today, and that work costs money, a lot of money. But we're at a point financially where we can wisely invest in our utilities, roads, and technology using dollars we have on hand. We held off on many of the, the nice-to-have projects in, in these areas over the past, or even should-haves, because we didn't want to take on more debt. Our priority was to live within our means and not burden future generations with this kind of financial impact. But now we can, and we must move forward with some of these projects I've mentioned. Our revenue recovery has really given us a boost of financial confidence. Our revenues in 2021 exceeded expenses by almost $33 million. In our general fund alone, we had an estimated $13 million surplus. And our progress towards achieving our three financial principles helped end last year on a strong note. That's right. The financial management strategies that we implemented in 2015 weathered one of the most unprecedented economic events in our lifetime. We've passed structurally balanced budgets. We've invested money into our services and staffing in areas like public safety, diversity, and sustainability. By the end of 2021, our cash reserves in our general fund were at $38 million. It's 29% of our operating expenses. And by the end of this year, we'll have reduced our general purpose debt by over 26%, and that exceeded our goal. We'll start looking at future financial principles with our Volunteer Financial Advisory Board this year. And I'm very proud that through this uncertainty, we've kept the city's part of your property taxes in check. The city's portion of the 2021 property tax bill for an average homeowner was $875. And this is going to decrease by about $20 on average in 2022. And now we have a chance to paint an even brighter picture, thanks to receiving over $13 million in the Federal American Rescue Plan funding. We're starting to talk about how that money may be invested in the, in the coming years. With all this impressive news, it's no surprise we received another AAA bond rating this year. That's 25 years in a row, folks. And all of this, yep. And all of this was achieved while navigating a pandemic and a natural disaster. disaster. I'd like to give a special thank you to the person whose expertise has kept us moving forward through not one, but two economic downturns. 
City manager Doug Krieger did the work to put the financial principles in place, and he kept them on track. He came into his current position during the Great Recession, and he has steadied the ship several times, to borrow a phrase from his old Navy days. Under him, our city services continued with no interruptions during the pandemic. I think we need to recognize how Doug has kept us afloat during the last decade and more. But he's, but he's also hard at work today advocating for the city's interest in Springfield, along with several of my colleagues on the council. I still think we need to give Doug and all the city council members a special round of applause. Thank you all for what you do. Serving our community is more than just meeting the basic services, though. We have to build a community of culture and compassion. It was great to see the community spirit come alive again in our parades and festivals. And so is the work we're doing in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Janice Williams has spent her first year as our DEI manager listening, learning, and engaging in tomorrow's leaders. She started by launching a Youth Inclusion Ambassadors Initiative. These are high school and college students who will spread the message of DEI. They'll also model what an inclusive community should look like, and they'll positively influence others through their work. In 2022, we have plans to partner with several organizations to hold educational events. We're also taking the time to learn from our employees to help us improve internally. We also looked at the future of art and culture in our community in 2021. Again, it's easy to brush aside the so-called nice-to-haves, like public art during times of crisis. But these amenities are what make our community stand apart. And having a plan and a policy for that art moving forward makes us sure to keep the visitors coming back, and it brightens the life of our residents. The work of our community partners also makes a difference makes a difference to everybody who lives here. They color the city's world with fun, recreation, support, reassurance, and hope. Let's take a minute to look back on what they've done in 2021.
As we step back and take a look at the year behind us and what's ahead, one thing is clear. We persevered. But now is not the time to rest. Our strength comes from our community's ability to adapt. Now is the time to be bold, to paint a picture so vivid, so colorful, that everyone locally, regionally, and nationally will take notice. We paint this picture by mixing and blending and creating something unique. Remember, we didn't build our current foundation by shying away. We believed we could set the stage for something greater. So we painted a picture and we succeeded in our work. But now, now it's time to paint a new portrait. The canvas is primed and it's up to us now. I can't, can't wait to see what we create. Naperville has never settled and we're not about to start now. Thank you.